Pachwe and me and Aimama. Welcome, brothers, sisters, to Oregon Indian Country. We welcome you, my relatives and brothers and sisters, to the live event and those listening on KWSO 91.9 FM and uh, the cell half moon from KCUW Umatella radio station. I'd like to thank you for joining the We Count Oregon's Census and Sovereignty live event. I will be, I'm um, Yelson Suppa. I'm of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, enrollment number 1014. I'm a full blood. I'm a descendant of the first people of Oregon. And I'm a son, a father, grandfather, uncle, cousin, you name it, that's me. I will be your host emceeing this next hour. We've got Representative Tana Sanchez, Jim Tucker from Native American Rights Fund, Ryan Redcorn from the 1491s, Willa Paulus and William Miller, and Jalene Joseph. And we're also going to be giving away four of eighth generation Oregon potlash blankets. You must be present on this Zoom call to win. Now I'm going to introduce Brian. Cribble, Confederated Tribes of Grand Round, and his nephews, Red Sky Clawson, Jacob Holmes, and Kikanam Masir, and they will be doing the blessing for this hour presentation with you. Brian.
Okay, thank you, Brian, Red Sky, Jacob, and Kikanam. That beautiful prayer song opens the floor for this live broadcast for this hour. I'd like to take a minute of reflection and prayer for our black community. Tribes and tribal organizations across the nation have been showing their solidarity for the movement for Black Lives Matter, and that includes NCAI. A moment of silence, please. Okay, thank you for that moment of silence. I'd like to ask you, when were Native Americans first counted in the census? <clears throat> I'd like to introduce Jim Tucker, Native American Rights Fund, and he will be talking about census and, and voting from his uh, position at NARP. Jim? Thank you so much, Delson. I want to make sure um, everyone can see my screen now. So I, I want to thank you so much. I'm very honored to be with you today. And I'm gonna just quickly go through some of the history of census and how natives have been counted or really not counted for much of the census um, and some of the challenges that we face going forward. And uh, most important of all, why we want to make sure that natives count in 2020. So for much of the history, natives did not really count because there were just estimates. They were not identified in the censuses going back from 1790 to 1840. And even where they were counted, they oftentimes were broken down by uh, whether or not the natives were considered to be civilized or not civilized. And as you're gonna see, they're largely estimates. So this is an image that you'll see from the 1930 census, and there was actually a, an Indian agent who was doing the counting, so the census hasn't always done the counting. You may not be able to see this, um, hopefully you can, but what it really shows is just how wide-ranging some of the estimates were. And the estimates were, were a little strange because you have Thomas Jefferson, Estimating in 1782 oh, okay. how many natives are are in the in the country. What's up? Okay. Um, Hi, Nani. Hi, sweetheart. Can I call you right back? Um, no, just. And then, if you look again at um, 1789 to 1890, you can see some of the different estimates. You'll see the first estimate from 1789 was 76,000, and then you see the first reports of the U.S. Census in 1870 that there are, um, they're estimating a little over 300,000. And again, this just gives you a flavor for some of the estimates. And again, you can just see the thing that's really interesting is for most of these, they recognize that they're just estimates. They have no idea. So you see the census of 1860, and it's broken down by civilized, and then they broke it down to other than civilized. And for those who don't know what civilized or not civilized mean, to be civilized, to be considered civilized by the American government, 
you had to give up your culture in all of your ways, um, your, your native religion, everything that makes you who you are, you had to adopt the white ways. And you can see from 1870 that they're giving an estimate of almost over two thirds of all of the natives in, in the United States were just estimates. They had no idea. And again, you can see 1890, one of the more comprehensive census. Again, very low numbers, um, even for that time, but they weren't accurate. So that brings us a little bit more to the, the contemporary time of when we're taking the census. And in 1990, this is actually something that you'll see even in some parts of Indian country today where the census workers have to get out there any way that they can. And you can actually see on the right, uh, a census enumerator who's on horseback uh, on Navajo lands. This is the big problem that we're facing going into the 2020 census, um, in addition to the other challenges, including the pandemic. In 2010, the undercount of those living on tribal lands was 4.9%. Um, in some places like Alaska, they actually estimate that the number of Alaska natives who are not counted was as much as 7.9% um, or higher. And there's no reliable estimate of how many natives who live in urban areas were not counted. So why does this matter? It's because being counted helps protect sovereignty. And I'll just explain in a few slides why. So it matters because of reapportionment and redistricting. For those who don't know what reapportionment means, it's what Congress, it's, it's how we determine how many congressional representatives are assigned to each state. But it matters a lot, especially for redistricting, not just at the federal and state level, but especially at the local level, where a lot of the decisions that affect your tribal communities most directly are made. And then in addition, uh, you see the native language provision. That's actually done to the American Community Survey, but the next one will be done next year. And then the final piece of this is federal funding. So I will always love throwing this in here because this is what a gerrymander looks like. This is actually a slide from the late 1700s. And you can see the gerrymander monster swallowing up portions of Massachusetts. So why does this matter? You wanna make sure that you elect representatives who respect tribal sovereignty. We're gonna pass laws that help and do not hurt your tribe. And we, we've seen a lot of that at the federal, state, and local levels. You wanna have someone who's going to help protect the environment and give you clean water and clean air and protect the land that you live on. You need to make sure that whoever is representing you that they're going to preserve and, and ideally try to even increase the subsistence hunting, fishing rights that you have as well as access to your lands. And then equally important, you have to make sure that your ancestral lands and cultural and historical and religious sites are protected. And for those who don't know, um, one of the things, for example, that NARP is doing right now is they're having to fight to regain the, the ancestral lands um, that involve bear's ears. Um, again, because it was set aside by the federal government only to be rolled back in the current administration. So federal funding, it's hard to say exactly how much it matters, but the National Conference of State Legislatures estimates it's between $3,300 and $3,500 per person each year. And so we always like to highlight that what that means is that if you have a family of four living in your community who is not counted, it's gonna cost your community over $140,000 in lost federal funding for the next 10 years. So this is what we wanna see. I, I love this theme. Uh, we wanna get the count back up. You wanna go back to a time, I don't know if it's gonna be possible to go back to a time with the 1491 census when the population was 100% Native American, but it is very, very important to get the count back up. And with that, this, this is my information. And again, I am so appreciative of the opportunity to speak and I'm very honored. And I really hope that everyone works together to get out the count in Oregon and the rest of Indian country. Thanks so much, Jim. Uh, this is Seattle Edmo. I'm the Tribal Community Coordinator for We Count Oregon. Um, and we'd love to use, um, thank you so much for your presentation and all the information. Um, we'd like to use this um, time right now as a first opportunity for folks who are joining us via Zoom uh, 
Um, we'd love to give away our first eighth generation Oregon potlatch blanket. Um, is there anyone on this Zoom call, um, Jim has done a lot of research into the census, but is there anyone who thinks that they can perhaps dump our census expert? Um, so just type your question in the chat and um, we're gonna see if we can't give away that first blanket um, right now. Anyone who has a question, go ahead and type it in. Here we go, first question from Ana Munoz. What law protects the census information? So the law that protects census information is Title 13 of the United States Code. And it's really important to keep that in mind. It's a great question. Uh, just remember that when you give your census information to, or to the census, it's going to be safe, secure, and private. Uh, but I will tell you, I think that we should have a winner in terms of the blanket because Title 13 is a little too broad. Um, I don't know the specific statute, so I think we should have a winner with that. Great, awesome. So that question came from Ana Munoz. If you could private message me your, um, your phone number, I will follow up with you. You are the winner of our first eighth generation blanket. Thanks. Back to you, Delson. Well, thank you, uh, Jim, for your history of tribal census and census and voting. Uh, Jim is from the Native American Rights Fund, NARV. And we would like to have people answer on chat for voter t-shirt prizes and why the census is critical to our communities. How does it serve us? Answer that on the chat box and have a chance at winning a t-shirt from Rebecca. Okay, uh, it's now time for our Ryan Redcorn of the infamous 1491s and acclaimed photographer. You got it, Ryan. Right. I think uh, C. Autumn's gonna ask me some questions about, yeah. my, about my career as a census worker. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, as you know, my name's Sea Autumn. I'm our um, tribal community coordinator here for the We Count Oregon campaign. And we're really lucky today um, to be interviewing Kenny Crawford, um, who is a census worker in Oregon, and I believe one of the longest serving census workers um, from uh, what, what is currently known as Oregon. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions, Kenny. Um, so first, um, how long have you been a census worker? Oh, you know, I've been an Oregon tribal tribal worker now for about, I'd say, 30 years. Yeah, when I started, when I started this job, there were, there were practically no Indians, you know, out there to do tribal census working. So I got the job, you know, and I'm just out there going like one little, two little, <laughs> yeah, it's a little Indian joke there for you, for you Indians. Yeah. Um, wow, um, that's a little racist. And um, so we're just keep, keep it moving. Just gonna keep it moving. Um, so uh, what do you like? Is there something that you like about being a census worker in Indian country? Well, you know, um, I get to go from reservation to reservation and I'm, I'm really into Indian lore. Yeah. And I'm just checking, you know, sacred sites on all the reservations that I go to. You know, I know the signs say do not enter, but I'm with the government and, and those signs are for tourists, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not a tourist, but I am a big rock collector. It's one of my hobbies. You know, uh, you won't believe what you find out there on some of those sacred sites. I mean, it's some really, there's some really cool stuff. Uh, so I, I just keep all that stuff in a very special place in the trunk of my car. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's illegal. 
Oh, no, no, it's perfectly fine. I'm with the government. And, you know, uh, it's, it's pretty exhausting, you know, doing all that, that collecting. So, you know, by the, if there's any time left in the day, then I just Google map the area that I'm in and then just guess how many people live there. It's, I'm pretty good at it. I'm like yeah. a really good estimator. I'm, I'm probably the best person you've ever met that can do math. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, so again, uh, y'all were he joined here by um, Kenny Crawford, longtime census worker for the U.S. Census Bureau, <clears throat> questionably. Um, uh, just a couple more questions, Kenny. Um, so, so what tribes have you visited um, in, in and around the Oregon Territory? Oh, all of them? Yeah, all of them. Uh, I, and I've made so many new friends in the process. You know, the Hammond family up in Burns, I just bumped into them one oh day, God. Safeway. Huh? Oh, what? I did. Continue, please. Continue. Oh, yeah, the Hammond family up in Burns, Oregon, I just bumped into them one day at the Safeway uh, when I was up there buying white rice, obviously. You know, just lovely <laughs> people invited me over to their sprawling ranch to discharge some firearms. You know, that was really fun. And uh, then I, I kicked it over at Grandy Rondi for a bit. That's French for drone baby. I, I took French for two weeks in junior college before I dropped out to work as a census worker. So I'm pretty fluent. Um, the good people at Grandy Rondi have been so open and welcoming. That's, that's not how you say that. Of course, it, I, they told me themselves. And uh, the Grandy Ron Daddy people, they, they welcomed me in their homes. And I went to an elder's house there, and they just talked my ear off, telling me, don't do this and don't do that. But with so much passion for the Grady Rousey culture. Unfortunately, the trip lasted even shorter than my time in French class. Um, and then I, I went over to Warm Springs. I saw some of their sacred sites over there. Uh, they took me to the Bud Light Tree. It's a real sacred site over there. But you know, the last time I was there, they were having some sewer issues. So if I'm being honest, there was no place to go to the restroom. So I just left and I copied and pasted the census information from the last time into this one. And then I was like, boom, off to Klamath to look at some meteorites. And uh, I think that's pretty much every tribe in Oregon right there. Yeah. Well, well, it's, it's just, it's not. So um, we're, uh, okay. Um, I think you probably missed some, um, but uh, can, can you just that's right, that's right. close I, this out? I'm sorry, I didn't miss, I did miss some. I forgot the great Pendleton Nation there. They make lovely blankets. Oh, that's not their name. Like, not at all. Um, okay. Uh, Great. So you take all your data off of Google and you pillage our sacred sites and you're super proud of your work. Okay. Um, can you um, just walk us through finally, um, what is a typical day um, on your, uh, on the job as a census worker in Indian country? Yeah. So I like to stay up really late and binge watch Netflix. So I usually don't wake up till about 11. Uh, and then I check my Facebook and my Instagram, my Twitter and my TikTok and my Snapchat. And I might take some selfies and send them out to the local babes I'm trying to count. Uh, then I'll hit the road about noon, which is time for lunch. So I stop and eat and I pack my lunch because I don't believe in government waste. All right. I don't believe in government waste. And so I, I eat my tuna fish sandwich out of my paper bag and, um, and then I get back on the road and I start visiting houses. But the main thing you got to look out for is res dogs. Now, I don't know what hell hole these foul creatures crawled out of, but I saw one in Worm Springs census worker hole. The dog ate this man hole and then he ate all of his census paperwork. Then I watched the res dog go over to the little res dog puppies under the house and then puke the half of the man up and then feed the res dog puppies. Then the res dog puppies ate the mama res dog. And ever since then, we just drive up to that house and honk and yell fry bread. And whoever comes out, that's who we count. And then we move on. I suspect there's a grandma in the house, but we don't really know for sure. But after we count on that house, then we just drive through the neighborhood. Well, most of them, we just guess there's like the same amount of people in every house. And then, um, you know, because my work is so efficient and I've saved the department so much money, uh, they gave me the go ahead to buy a drone. 
So now I just fly it over the reservation and count that way. Plus drones are cool. Though a res dog has eaten three of my drones so far. One straight jumped off an old car that didn't have any wheels on it and then just snatched it right over the air and just <laughs> chewed it up right in front of me. That's a true story. Uh, okay. I'm glad. So um, here, here, everybody, um, we were, um, that was just Kenny Crawford. Um, uh, three decades uh, with the census in Indian country in Oregon. Um, so, uh, you're welcome. Clear, oh, uh, it's clear we have a lot of work to do. So, um, anyway, I'll be, uh, thank, I'll be accepting interns if anybody wants to be trained in on how to be a citizen. No, no, nobody's allowed to be an intern with him. No, no. Come be an intern with me. Um, so thanks. Uh, thanks, Kenny. And now um, I'd like to kick it over to two women that I very much admire. Um, and thank you um, again to Ryan for that little bit. Um, to uh, Tana Sanchez um, from the Shoshone Bannock tribes, who is also um, a representative for House District 43, and Nicole Adams, consultant for the National Urban Indian Family Coalition and um, our very own NAYA Family Center. Um, so let's go ahead and unmute um, both Tana and Nicole. Um, to join us here to talk about um, the real importance to um, the census and those of us uh, in Indian country in Oregon. Welcome, Tana and Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, folks are welcome to intern for me as well. <laughs> Do that, please. <laughs> yes. Do that, please. Definitely. So I don't know who's starting here. I can go ahead. Okay. Fabulous. Um, so Tana Sanchez, I'm the state representative for House District 43, which is north and northeast Portland. And let me just say one of the things that I, I think is so amazingly important about the census is, is the fact that, uh, well, first of all, let me just say, I'm only the second Native American to ever serve in the Oregon legislature. And the person before me was a uh, citizen Potawatomi, uh, and she represented Astoria in the mid-90s. So what that says is that how we re are represented, even in our own state, is very, very thin at this point. And, you know, as Seattle said, I'm Shoshone, Bannock, and Ute. I'm not even an Oregon tribal member. We should be representing this state as, as Native people. We should, be, we should be making our voices heard. We should be uh, advocating for our, our, our lands and our resources and, and resources coming to us from the state itself. And that's what the most important thing is, is that if we're counted and our numbers are actually there to show people we are still here, that's going to be the important thing about getting those resources to our areas and getting that representation on a larger, more federal level. Um, I do want to identify that, that I remember as a young person, probably, gosh, well, I was young a long time ago, maybe it was back in the 70s even, that I remember hearing an estimate that by the year 2000, we would all be gone that we would be melted into the big pot. That was the original intention, right? And I remember just this huge powwow in, you know, the New Year's Eve in 1999. And the dance was all about that we are still here. And we are still here. We've been here, but we're not being as counted. We're not counted as well as we could be. And we need to do that. We need to have greater representation. I need somebody else to be in the Oregon legislature with me. We need somebody to represent us on a federal level to make sure that people know we are here and that know, and know that we're not giving up. We're not giving up one piece of land, one, one ounce of water that we don't have to. We need to make sure that people know that Native people still exist in this world and we're not just a part of storybooks. So needed to say that. Great, thank you. Um, Nicole, so what have, you, what have you found out in your work on the census? Um, I have, um, it's been a very quick and um, very fascinating learning curve for me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just a little work that I've done with Naya, we, um, we not only like, well, I've worked with the National Urban Indian Family Coalition with a bunch of other urban Indian centers around the country to talk about the messaging and how this carry over messaging from the 
um, some of the other campaigns that we're doing um, echo exactly what Tana is saying, you know, that um, uh, with the tagline, you know, making the invisible visible. And we follow that up with some focus groups in, in amongst um, some folks who uh, visit NEA to find out exactly what their perceptions were about the census. So I'll get to that in, a, in just a second. But um, I think, you know, I'm, first of all, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak on a, an important matter and cannot believe that I um, am, am, you know, sort of sharing time with uh, the Tana Sanchez, um, who is uh, just needs a whole hour for herself to share her experiences. Also recently, I learned that through marriage, I am cousins with Ryan Redcorn, although now I'm thinking that I need to disavow any uh, relations there through my Oklahoma relatives. But anyways, um, getting to uh, the question is like, why is it important? Well, I um, really love uh, the indomitable uh, Stacey Abrams and a lot of the work that she's been doing in her, in her sense of um, outreach boiled it down to it's about money and power and basically she says fill out your senses get your money get your power and i agree with that but it's sometimes with this messaging that we hear it's not very well tailored to the needs of our tribal communities and so you know in some of these focus groups i said well when you hear census helps build infrastructure what does that mean well if you know you're from a reservation community um, talking about, you know, new airports and new bridges and new roads doesn't necessarily um, hit home. It's not quite the motivation that you need to say like, well, that's, that's somebody else's stuff, not our stuff. So why am I doing this? Well, um, you know, just a few things I think that people need to understand is um, that the funding that goes into our communities, I have a whole list of things. Um, that might resonate a little bit better with our communities is that you know hospitals including and healthcare services including IHS um, specific services for Native American communities um, our community centers like the one at NAYA get federal funding um, schools and uh, drop Indian dropout prevention programs um, uh, someone I was working with reminded me that Johnson O'Malley programs that rely on census data sometimes fund you know, even basketball uniforms for the basketball teams that we have. Um, emergency services, which like right now, what we're seeing going on as far as um, limited resources going into um, our native healthcare systems to adequately treat and help prevent um, the spread of COVID, you know, that's a direct result of our numbers not reflecting our actual populations. You know, WIC, SNAP, um, Indian housing programs, uh, money for tribal courts, including those that advocate for uh, child welfare services and family services, and again, like roads and highways. Um, so a couple of things that I wanted to point out that it might be relevant to some conversations that we're having right now are that, um, you know, this money, when we don't claim it by, by not participating in the census, and that money doesn't just disappear, it is reallocated somewhere else. And where is it reallocated? Typically, it goes to those communities where there's overrepresentation. More people are filling out the census than, um, than are in our communities. And those are wealthy white communities. So again, we are, in essence, when we don't fill out the census, uh, facilitating um, an imbalance in the resources that go out there. I like that someone brought up that it's 33 to 3,500. I've seen that every year, $675 billion um, in, of funding going to Indian country. Um, that's what we're talking, billions and billions and billions of dollars. Um, I think that as the future rolls forward, because it's not just about rectifying the problems of the past, and turning the corner to be like, no, we, we are going to be seen. Um, we are, there's a hashtag out there, statistically significant, because we are told so many times that natives are not statistically significant enough to be even included in the research or included in the data. And we are saying, no, yes, we're here. We're statistically significant and we are righting the wrongs of the past. But more than that, because children under five are the least, uh, are the most undercounted population. We are also trying to ensure that resources and the strength of our communities 
are taken care of for the future. I think right now, a very timely thing to remember is that it's not just, um, um, well, the economic recovery, we are in a recession and it's going to be tough times for, for the future, foreseeable future. Um, the census data, including that for that, what we come up with in Indian country is gonna help allocate the money that goes into that, um, into our community. So we can't sit this one out and again, watch the rest of the country recover while we sit and continue to um, struggle. The other thing is um, uh, more timely with what we're seeing with uh, what's going on in the streets of every community in the country is this imbalance of funding. This is my opinion, um, going to the police services to take care of other things that typically should not be done by the police, such as mental health services and services for those with addiction issues. Um, and so again, when we are talking about shifting systemic problems that lead to what's going on right now, again, our voice is in that data. Our voice and our power is included in our numbers. And so there are some hangups, I'm getting short on time, sorry about this, but um, that people have regarding privacy um, issues. Uh, there's a reason why we're kind of not that trustworthy of the government when they're asking us personal questions. That's, that is understandable. And I hope someone's going to talk about the privacy concerns. Again, our communities, Native people are Native, Native people are Black people. Native people are uh, Latinx. You know, we are a very diverse community within the Native American community. I know there is some concern about, um, you know, information going to ICE, um, but there is no immigration question on the census. Um, so well, there's a lot of concerns. Those are understandable, but in the end, um, there's answers to those concerns. They are being addressed, and the census is safe to fill out for Native families. So um, awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you, Tana. Um, one thing again, before I hand it over to Delson, sorry to jump in here again. Um, you mentioned something so important and that is kids. So um, can we use this as our second opportunity to give away one of those eight gen blankets? Um, if you have a kid that's with you who's on this Zoom call, will you type into the chat the name of uh, the age of your child and we're going to give an eighth gen blanket to the youngest person on this call oh we got a two-year-old we got an 11 year old we got a one-year-old <gasps> one-year-old i feel like that one-year-old is the youngest person okay now we got two one-year-olds how how many months oh four month old four month old two month old Yay, yay for the babies. Yay for all the Indian babies. Um, so Lamaya, will you um, please um, uh, chat me your phone number and let's get on the line and I will make sure we um, mail that blanket to you. Thanks. Um, thanks again, Nicole and Tana and back to you, Delson. Thank you, yes, I will. Delson, you're on mute. Delson, you're on mute. It's not, a, there you go. Delson, you're on mute. Hey, well, I'm gonna pop in here and go ahead and introduce um, our, next, uh, our next couple of speakers. Um, oh, no, wait, I'm gonna introduce um, our Illuminative video. Um, so many of you are familiar with Illuminative. Um, they're an amazing um, group of folks working to change the narrative about Indians and Indian country. 
um, all over the United States. And um, here it is. The whole world has been impacted by COVID-19. Native communities are being hit especially hard. But here are some of the most famous Native Americans we could find. You probably haven't heard of any of them. So we've added celebrities. Maybe you'll listen to them. Let's go, then. There are a lot of unknowns. But our ways can help us beat COVID-19. In times of need. We always come together. When we dance. When we sing. When we pray. But now it's time to stay away. I mean, we're going to be coming together by staying away from each other. We're gonna be staying away from each other, but coming together at the same time by staying away from each other. I'm washing my hands. I'm not washing my dishes that much, but I, but I'm washing my hands. I ain't hanging out with no one. No one, not even him. Except them, but they're my kids, I have to. No matter how lonely I get. I ain't inviting anyone over. Mm -mm. Listen to the experts. Not my auntie's boyfriend's kid's uncle. Though I'm sure he's a nice guy. He borrowed me 20 bucks at one time. If you're feeling ill, seek help with you. This virus works quickly. Especially among our elders and our most vulnerable. I am staying inside. I am eating my veggies. Don't go over to your snag's house either. What's a snag? <laughs> no, mom. I know that even if I feel okay, I can spread it to people I love. And the people you don't love, like your exes. But I am going to pray that you all wash your hands. I am going to hope that you stay the heck away from each other. Stay six feet away from me. I am protecting the elders by staying away from them. And I know that even if I feel okay, I could still be spreading it to somebody that I love. I'm going to be a good nephew. I'm going to be a good niece. A good parent. A good grandson. A good relative. A good auntie. I'm going to be a good example. So keep your flat Indian butt home. Help slow the spread of the coronavirus. Listen up, or I'm not sewing y'all any more moccasins. Do it for your grandma. Do it for my grandma. Decolonize Corona. I don't know if that's how decolonization works. That's what they want you to think. You know what? Never mind. Yes, let's decolonize coronavirus. Uh -huh. We can defeat this. So stay away from each other. Hmm. But together. Stay away together. Stay away together. Until then, we'll see you at the next dance, cousin. Okay, am I am I unmuted? <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you, Illuminative. Oh, that was wonderful to have a, a statement like that given to our people to understand how important census uh, forms are needing to be filled out in Indian country. So we're one hundred percent counted. Uh, let's see who's paying attention. Who is Superman hanging out with? Put it in the chat box uh, to Rebecca. And I'd also like to give a shout out to uh, artist Asa Wright, who created an amazing series of original artwork that has been featured on We Count Oregon. And I'd like to see the t-shirt, the voting t-shirt also exhibited if we can, so that people can see what they have an opportunity to win if they answer the questions in chat. So another question, why is it important to light up COVID-19 that tribal member, tribal people are counted? Okay, yeah, answer that in chat. And I'm now going to have the honor and privilege to introduce Jalene Joseph from the Native Wellness Institute. Jalene? Thanks, Delson. Good afternoon, everyone. Can we get a wave? <laughs> awesome. I, I always call this my Native Brady Bunch. We have all these. Um, beautiful uh, faces all over the screen. So we just wanted to end um, 
our begin to end and close our time together just in a good way to help uplift one another and to just acknowledge like the the time that we're in like we're in the middle of a revolution i think that is so awesome and amazing and our census is a part of that because when we find our voice and use it as we see every day with people protesting when we find our voice and use it, that includes like filling out the census. We're using our voice when we fill out the census, you know, so, so please do that. And I just wanted to end with this story. Um, some of you on here have, have heard it before, but um, like I said, my name is Jolene and my people are in my language are uh, uh, me, our white clay people I'm from Fort Belknap, Montana. We're, we're Buffalo people. And a long time ago before cell phones, uh, when I was a teenager, we were um, we were on a buffalo hunt. Well, we just went to watch this buffalo hunt and we were getting these buffalo for our tribal celebration. And there was two pickup loads of hunters and we were the third pickup that was way in the back just watching. And it was very clear um, that the hunters needed a third truck to come in and help because there was like a fence line and two trucks and the buffalo were in the middle and they, they couldn't get them to stop. So they, they waved us in and so um, my cousins and I were, we drove out there and we became the third truck to pen the buffalo in. And the buffalo kept running one way, then they would turn around, they would run the other way. So we would drive forward. We wouldn't have time to turn around. So I'd put it in reverse and I'd drive backwards, drive forward, backwards, forward, backwards. And all the while I'm getting closer and closer to the herd. And then all of a sudden the, the big bull turned and the whole herd, like 50 buffalo started charging our pickup. And I, I just froze and I didn't know what to do. So I just honked my horn. <laughs> and then some, somebody said, well, why didn't you drive off? It's like, well, I didn't think of it in the moment. <laughs> so this buffalo herd just went by our truck like this. And the first hunter um, got shot the first buffalo and the buffalo dropped. And then this amazing thing happened. The whole buffalo herd turned around and came back and circled that buffalo. And with their horns, they picked the buffalo back up. They picked it up and then they circled him and they continued to run. And so I'm sharing that story because like many of our community members, um, whether it's from COVID, whether it's because of the lasting impacts of historical and intergenerational trauma, the lasting impacts of racism and oppression, like many of our community members have gone down, right? Have gone down. So it's up to us like to circle our communities and circle our people and lift them back up, right? Like that's all of our jobs. When we talk about being that good relative, that's what that means is to circle our people and to lift them back up. Maybe it'll be with a text. Maybe it'll be with a phone call. Maybe it'll be with an email. Maybe it'll be with our prayers, right? But that, that's our job is to circle around each other and lift each other up. And I think it's beautiful how the native community is coming out in full support of the Black Lives Matter movement. And we're doing that because we know that we're included in that movement. We know that this revolution is impacting us as well. We are gonna benefit from participating in this revolution that we are gonna help to end racism and oppression in this country, like it's in us. Yes, we have experienced historical trauma and, and intergenerational trauma. And more importantly, we have that historical and intergenerational wisdom within us. So I just wanted to share that with you. And I thank everyone for um, the opportunity to be here with you. And let's get out and vote. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Jillian Joseph, for those powerful, powerful traditional teachings that we hand down from one generation to another. I'd like to go back to Willa Paulus of the Klamath Tribal Council and William Miller, and they will talk about how to work and some strategies um, about COVID-19. Willa? Hi, everybody. Um, well, uh, these have been, been some tough acts to follow, but I'll try and do my best here. Um, I think the biggest thing is what you guys have been watching this whole time is that what we're doing in Indian country and especially in Oregon is we're taking a holistic approach to um, the census. And when all our buildings got shut down because of COVID-19, what we did is we moved everything to an online platform. We built these 
uh, tremendous relationships with each other and a huge collaboration with all these organizations and other tribes and talking about how we can best reach our people because we do have those hard to count communities and it's so important to get out there and count um, a lot of people that don't want to take the census and we do, we do have a lot of people that already took the census but we need you to also advocate for your family and friends that haven't taken it yet and get everybody out there and get counted because it's about building healthier and stronger communities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Willa. I, I would also add that, you know, we've, we are in incredibly unprecedented and uncertain times. Um, and we have had to quickly shift our strategy to reaching out to community, engaging community, and getting community to trust our, our message about the importance of the 2020 census. And I want to add that, that we've done this effectively and efficiently and continuing to outreach to our most vulnerable populations, our elders, our young ones, um, by encouraging our community to stay home and save lives. But also while you're home, that project you put on the sidelines can hold off just for 10 more minutes while you fill out your census. And in that process, um, the response from the federal government will come from census data once this virus is subsides. Um, the pandemic relief, those dollars will come into community based on the populations who need them the most. And so representation is in fact an act of decolonization. And I want to just point that out that the work that we're doing in Indian country today, not just in Oregon among our tribal populations, but all throughout Indian country in the United States is an act of decolonization because we are forcing the federal government to recognize us more than ever before. Uh, the federal government oftentimes likes to invisibilize our people, uh, and it's time we stand up and continue to stand up and be seen and be heard in this process. So a, a worldwide pandemic has never kept us down before, and it won't keep us down again. So encourage those around you to fill out their census. Okay, thank you, Willa Paulus of the Klamath Tribal Council and William Miller. And you know, all the things that were said today are very important to us as a people. You know, our people, we need to bring our ancestors' spirit of way of life to life today. Because all people were counted. There was no status within the tribes. Everybody was taken care of. And as Jalene told that story, that's what it reminded me of, is our traditional teachings that must be handed down from one generation to another. And we must be counted. So please fill out your census forms and get them in as soon as possible. And we count Oregon and the nine tribes and the urban organizations that exist will be counted officially and accurately. And I want to thank um, C. Autumn for helping out. And it's too small. She oh. wants to give away two blankets. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, C. Autumn, if you want to take over and give away two more of those famous eighth generation Oregon potlash blankets, now's your Great. time. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, everyone. Um, so uh, we have two more blankets and we honored our youngest person on this call. Now we want to honor and now is not the time to be shy. Our eldest elder on the call. Who is our eldest elder on the call? Don't be shy. Type in your type in your. Oh, we got 64, 55, 64 so far. Is our eldest elder somebody saying Delson? Oh, my dad's in at 74. Who else? Who else? Eldest elder Delson, how old are you? Oh, 74. 74. Wait, are you 74 too? Do we have a tie? We might just have to give away two blankets. I think it's a three-way tie. <laughs> oh, no, wait. Jillian Joseph's mom. Oh, oh girl is gone. She Whoa. couldn't get on. I was trying to help her get on. She registered, though. 
I feel like that counts. You registered. 84. Estella Batista is 84, her dad. I think 84. 84 wins it. Estella, will you private message me your um, information and um, we'll make sure that eighth generation blanket gets over to you. Um, I see Caroline Cruz on this call. For some reason, she's got my name as her name. I'm not sure what's going on there, but I'm the original C. Autumn Edmo. That's cute though. Um, so before we go, we are gonna take, can you believe it? We have 105 folks on this call right now. Um, and I am going to pick one other person. I'm gonna scroll through um, everybody who's on my Zoom and I'm gonna pick one other person at random to receive our last eighth generation blankets. And as I do, I'm gonna take everybody's photo. So um, at the count of three, I want you all to say fry bread. Ready, one, two, three. Bread. Oh my gosh, so many, I'm scrolling through so many. Good job, good job. Oh, Perla, you're so cute. Okay. And four. And last screen, five. Okay. And then we'll pick a person at random. Hey, um, to receive the last one, so I'm gonna close. Close my eyes and click on someone here. Um, I clicked on Gordon Scott. So Gordon Scott, if you could email me your, um, your contact details, your phone number, I will make sure that you get that last blanket. Um, I'm going to do, I'm going to do one more t-shirt for this native boat t-shirt. Awesome. I want to see who for this question, how many Native Americans have been elected to state legislator? Brittany Hardy. Brittany, if you can, uh, Email me your shirt size and your address. <clears throat> that would be great. I will put I'll put my email inside the chat box. Thanks. Well, thanks everyone for logging on during your lunch hour. We really appreciate it. And um, as Jillian Joseph said, we're in the middle of a revolution, and the census is part of it. Have a great day.